Good morning, everyone. My name is Abhishek Mathur, and I will be your MC today. Uh, as uh, you might have seen on our website, or you might have heard about us from uh, uh, your friends, and uh, yesterday at Pride as well. We uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we are Houston's own secular community. There we go. Uh, there's uh, Jennifer reminding me to be a little louder. So. Uh, we have uh, we are uh, we run by our core values. Uh, a couple of them I'd like to mention here: people are more important than than beliefs, and human hands solve human problems. And we have uh, been practicing these through our various events. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our main speaker, uh, Andrew Torres, who's uh, founded his own law firm in the D.C. area. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard and wa George Washington University. He's also the co-host of the very popular Opening Arguments podcast, the legal podcast that may helps you make sense of the news. And uh, given uh, all these week's events, it's a very timely topic, and uh, we would love to. Uh, uh, we're gr grateful that he could uh, make it uh, to uh, to our talk on a very short notice. And so, uh, go ahead, Andrew. Abhishek, thank you very much for having me. Uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Great. Let me share out my slides. And while we're doing that, I just want to thank Alexis Boggs Potaman, Houston Oasis, for inviting me here today. Uh, slides look good? Yes. Great. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you virtually to give you an update on the Supreme Court's 2022 spring term. Also, big thanks to Joe and Nathan. You guys sounded great. Um, that uh, a lot of uh, folks over in the YouTube comments are, uh, are pointing out uh, that they're, they're digging the music. Uh, and <clears throat> we could use some music right now. Um, just like the last time I spoke here at uh, Houston Oasis, well, that was in person, I have lured you under false pretenses. Here is the actual title of the speech. Yes, the Supreme Court hates you. Yes, you personally. And what very little you can do about it. Now, before we get into that, the Houston Oasis the Houston Free Thought Oasis, a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization, and nothing in this speech is or is intended to advocate on behalf of or in opposition to any political campaign or any candidate for public office. And of course, nothing in this speech constitutes legal advice or creates an attorney client relationship. Don't take legal advice from this speech. Oh, uh, and, and the puppy is there for two reasons. First, a lot of you listen to my show, and that is indeed Lily, the opening arguments puppy. And second, times are really bad, so I have included an adorable picture to help ease the pain. Part one, can't believe it's not milk. This is the Supreme Court. It looks like the Parthenon. That's on purpose. If you Google it, you will find that the single phrase that is most often used to describe the Supreme Court is that august body. Now, august means dignified and impressive, noble, worthy of respect. But I am here to tell you today that there was and is only ever one reason to, to respect the Supreme Court. This is the Caroline Products Company, today a wholly owned subdivision of Eagle Family Foods Group, LLC, former manufacturers of, I swear to you, I'm not making this up, Mill Nut a sludge of condensed skim milk thickened with coconut oil. Congress banned it as, quote, an adulterated article of food injurious to the public health, end of quote. Uh, it was basically the mulk of the 1920s and 30s, right? Chemically formulated with vitamin R. Use it to replace milk in all of your recipes if you cannot afford milk, like, you know, pretty much everyone during the Great Depression. And um, there's something else that you need to know which is that 
uh, from 1897 to 1937 was what we lawyers call the Lochner era of the Supreme Court. It was 40 years of right wing judicial activism in which the Supreme Court invented nonsensical constructions of property rights and struck down pretty much every progressive law for 40 years as being unconstitutional. Everything good? Okay. Minimum wage, unconstitutional. Maximum working hours, unconstitutional. You couldn't regulate workplace conditions. You could not ban child labor. And let me emphasize some math here. The Lochner era ran for 40 years. By contrast, the Supreme Court has only been in full-on howler monkey mode for the past five years since Mitch McConnell stole Merrick Garland's Supreme Court seat and gave it to Neil Gorsuch in 2017. So if you think, oh, you know, this is one of those things where the pendulum just kind of swings back and forth, and I'm sure it'll fix itself, or, hey, you know, really bad outcomes now will accelerate the socialist revolution in two years. There's 40 years of abject misery that would like to beg to differ, and that happened to us less than a century ago. So now, back to Caroline Products. They were indicted for selling this crap in 1936, and they argued that the law was unconstitutional. And you'd think they'd have to feel pretty good about their chances before the right wing hacks that, you know, constituted the Lochner court. Right. I mean, if you can make kids work 90 hours a week in the uranium mines, what's a little vitamin R? Right. Except Caroline Products couldn't have known that it was going to have his case decided in 1938. That's the year that Franklin Roosevelt threatened to pack the court if it didn't change its ways. And uh, shockingly, the Supreme Court suddenly stopped just making up the constitutional right of corporations to work 12 year olds to death. Now, that probably happened. And it probably helped that Franklin Roosevelt had just won the presidential election by an unprecedented two to one margin, 523 electoral votes to eight. Put a pin in that. So the really important thing here isn't that the Supreme Court said it was okay to pass laws against selling milky sludge. In fact, if you're feeling as depressed as I am about recent events, it probably will not surprise you to learn that the Caroline Products Company changed the name of their flagship product from Mill Nut to Mill Not, got bought out by Borden Milk, got bought out again by Eagle Foods. And right now, this very minute, you can whip out your cell phone You can go to www.millnot.com and order up some tasty Millnot from a participating store near you. Make sure you get the original, though. It's the only oil-thickened skim milk product with soybeans and 100% of the recommended daily allowance of dipotassium phosphate. Because, you see, this is never really about Caroline products, the product. For all I know, Milnot is delicious, right? And its mutagens give you superpowers. I don't know. Lawyers don't care about that. What we care about is why the Supreme Court decided what it did. And actually, we don't even care about that. What we really care about is this little footnote right here. Footnote four, the most famous footnote in history. Remember, this number right here. This is the only good reason at all that the Supreme Court has ever had, has, or will deserve your or anyone's support. So let's take a look at what it says. Hey, uh, I, I said this footnote was important. I didn't say that it was easy to decipher, but, um, but here's what's going on. Okay, In the main text, the Supreme Court in 1938 finally realized something that should have been super obvious to it for the past 40 years, which is, you know, the Caroline Products Company, a wholly owned subsidiary of Eagle Family Foods Group, LLC, does not need the Constitution's help. They've got money. They've got influence. Either they can persuade Congress to let them sell mill nut or mill not or whatever, or maybe Congress will make them go back and change it, take out a couple of carcinogens. But look, this is precisely the kind of thing that we should leave up to the democratic process. Right. And so for economic regulations, the Supreme Court announced a rule in 1938 that is so far anyway, is still the rule today. And that is if Congress can show a rational basis for your ordinary economic regulations, the corporation has to follow the law, right? Rational basis, 
we don't want to work kids to death in the uranium mines legislation minimum working ages minimum wage maximum working hours workplace conditions all of those were about to get approved by the same Supreme Court that had just spent 40 years striking them down. The Supreme Court was also worried about something in this in this case, right? And that's why they wrote this footnote. And here's what it says. It starts off with, look, we want to be super careful here with what we're saying. Congress can't do anything on a rational basis, only the stuff we think you can probably fix with the political process, like the whole mill nut, mill nut, right? If you're talking about, and and now we're in the second paragraph, laws that restrict your right to vote, well, or or laws that otherwise interfere with the political process, it would be pretty stupid of us to say, uh, use the political process to fix that, right? Instead, we might use, and, and this is their language, more exacting judicial scrutiny of those kinds of laws. And that makes total sense. And now we get to the third paragraph, and this is the part I've highlighted. The Supreme Court in 1938 recognized that sometimes the political process doesn't work well for uh, people who aren't white men and corporations, right? For discrete and insular minorities, that tends to, quote, curtail the operation of those political processes ordinarily to be relied on to protect minorities. Again, I get it. It's it's 100 year olds legalese. Here's what that means. If you're pro mill nut, you might find yourself in the majority like now, I guess. Right. Or you might find yourself in the minority like in the 1930s. But there's no sense that you're permanently stuck in one of those groups. Right. You can persuade people to join your cause and your opponents can do the same thing. So those minorities are fluid. But when a minority is discrete, that is comprised of members who are easily identifiable and insular, that is capable of being written off by everyone else who isn't a member of the group and incapable of changing that identity, we think that the democratic process can't always fix things. And that's where the Constitution comes in. This is the legitimate role of the Supreme Court to step in on behalf of discrete and insular minorities and say, hey, we're going to protect you from the stuff the minority We're going to protect you from the stuff the majority might want to do to you because you're different. And the Supreme Court didn't just make that up in 1938. You will hear how this court claims to value history and tradition. Well, you don't get more historical than the literal founding fathers who wrote the Federalist Papers, the documents that were the arguments for ratifying the Constitution. And you may recall a Mr. James Madison who went on to become president of the United States. And here he is when he's asked to describe one of the reasons to ratify the Constitution, some of the problems predating the Constitution, he says, quote, complaints are everywhere heard, end of quote, that our laws, quote, are too often decided not according to the rules of justice and the rights of the minority party, but by the superior force of an interested and overbearing majority. And so the founding fathers the ones this Supreme Court claims to revere, set aside a special institution to occasionally, every once in a while, take those rules of justice and enforce the rights of the minority against even the majority. And that brings us to part two. So um, I get emails. (laughs) And when we started the show, I get a lot of emails from conservatives who wanted to argue that abortion wasn't a constitutional right. And by some completely inexplicable reason, they all started off with the same terrible argument. And when I say terrible, I mean laughably bad on the level that other lawyers will point at you and snicker. Not me, though, because I'm super nice and I was very patient. And that argument was this. Where does it say abortion in the Constitution? And the response here, really simple. Constitution does not say abortion. It also does not say a word about dating, marriage, condoms, clothes, hair color, adult toys, or everyone's favorite, butt stuff. And so I would say to them, suppose a state, let's 
say it rhymes with schmexus, decides to ban at one go interracial dating, interracial marriage, condoms, adult sex toys, wearing off the shoulder dresses, coloring your hair, purchasing vibrators, and of course, butt stuff all at once. And by the way, these are all real things that states have either tried or have successfully banned over the years. Not making any of this up. Does that really seem like the land of the free? Does it really seem like you have any liberty? What does it mean to be in a free country if you can have a state impose those dozen restrictions on your most personal aspect of your life? And then I would show them the text of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments here. And I'd ask them a question. I'd say, what do you think the founding fathers meant by that word liberty? Now, I will tell you, the first pushback you get, this is not a knockdown instantly. The first pushback you get is, oh, yeah, well, that just means the stuff that's written in the Constitution, like freedom of speech, things that actually said, not stuff you make up, right? And then I say, all right, let's think about that argument for a second. If the government tries to censor you, to take away your freedom of speech, you would sue under the First Amendment, right? Those are, those are First Amendment claims. That's, that's why we call it that, right? That's the one that says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. And they'd say yes. And I'd say, and you'd never hear anyone say you need something other than the First Amendment to protect you against being censored, right? And they'd say, yeah, no. And so I would say, right, so think about that. If liberty only means the rights that are otherwise specified in the Constitution, then these amendments are literally worthless. They don't protect anything because anything already spelled out is protected in the section that spells it out, right? It doesn't need to be included in the definition of liberty. And you know what? They would slowly come around. And then I would get to the argument that says, okay, um, but liberty can't just be whatever a judge makes up, right? Like, that's crazy. And of course, that's an Antonin Scalia talking point and has been one for 40 years. But now my trap was sprung. That is from the concurrence in Griswold versus Connecticut. And those internal citations are, in some cases, almost 100 years old. And what it shows is that throughout pretty much our entire nation's history, liberty in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments means the stuff that isn't written down, that is not specifically mentioned in the first eight amendments. That doesn't mean that it's up for grabs or for a judge's personal whims. Rather, it means you ask yourself, are these rights fundamental? Are they implicit in the concept of ordered liberty? Are they intensely personal and private? Is it like the list that I just went through? And for a hundred years, this worked pretty well. Wish Samuel Alito had, uh, had emailed my show. Yeah, right there on page one of his majority opinion in Dobbs issued on Friday, two days ago, is Roe is terrible because the Constitution doesn't mention abortion. Literally, the dumbest argument anyone ever leveled at a podcast, and it just got made by our Supreme Court. And you're probably guessing, with the box being in the upper left-hand corner and all, that Alito goes to this well more than once, and you would be correct. In major sections of the opinion, Alito's argument is that because the word abortion is not explicitly in the Constitution, it must be viewed with extreme suspicion unless it is, quote, deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions. And so we get to, and, and, and again, this is the only paragraph in the Dobbs decision that matters. The legal conclusion, because abortion isn't in the Constitution, isn't said by name, we need to look to see if it is deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions, because it was criminalized in 1868 by the vast majority of states, it can't be deeply rooted in our nation's traditions. Therefore, it's not a right. Each and everything that I mentioned in that long list as also not being in the Constitution was also, by the way, the subject of criminal punishment by 1868. Contraceptives, interracial dating and marriage, and of course, simply existing as an LGBTQ person. Clarence Thomas says as much in his concurrence, although weirdly he leaves the interracial marriage part out, which I'm sure is unrelated to the fact that he is married to a white woman. I want to make two observations 
about this new test that the Supreme Court has forged by deliberately ignoring our nation's actual history in its zeal to overturn the right to an abortion. Point one, by requiring a right to be deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions in order to count as implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, it means that by definition, only those who don't need the Constitution's protection could possibly get it, right? You have to prove that the liberty you want protected by is a thing that was already being protected during the ordinary political process. This is the exact opposite of footnote four of Caroline Products. And point two, deeply rooted traditions means the traditions that were in place at the time the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments were ratified. That's why 1868 is so important. Right. This means in no uncertain terms that only the traditions of white, male, cisgendered, heterosexual landed property owners will ever count to the Supreme Court. This means the traditions of slave owners count in defining what liberty is, but the traditions of slaves do not. So when I said that this Supreme Court hates you personally, I was not being facetious. Or hyperbolic. If you're a white, male, cis, hetero, landed property owner, you're probably okay, uh, unless you're an atheist. So uh, oops on that one. You will not find a lot of well-established atheist traditions in 1868 either. And if you're everyone else, you never had a chance. So now what? First, some more disclaimer stuff. You know, if this was a church, I wouldn't have to do this, but we aren't. So I am cognizant that this is a speech before a 501c3 organization. This is the text of 26 USC 501c3 up here. My point is not to influence legislation or to promote any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office. Instead, I'm going to talk to you about candidates in the past. That's fair game. And principles for the future. That's also fair game. And um, some of you are not going to like this. I was asked to give this presentation uh, about 40 hours ago on a Friday night in between two three-hour recording sessions. And by the way, I still run a law firm too. Uh, I said yes so that I could give this part of the speech because I intend to fight with everything I have to try and take back what we've lost. And a lot of that work is work at the grassroots and local level building communities, working with organizations that, for example, transport women and pregnant patients across state lines to states that protect the right to an abortion. Listen to opening arguments for more on that. But, but politically, th there is one and only one thing that you can do, and it is not much, and I know it, but you have to do it anyway. Um, look, I get that people are hurting and are desperate and angry right now. Uh, but this exchange on, on Twitter is literally the worst possible take. The person who wrote this, someone I consider a friend, um, finds out about the speech, he's probably going to be mad. But uh, he's a fellow podcast host, and I eagerly await when his show comes out. It's, it's one of the top of the queue. This is someone who is on our side. This person was so angry on Friday they said things that I think are about to make things much, much worse. So let's unpack this exchange. It starts with, hey, F you if you're telling me the solution is to vote. And by the way, spoiler alert, the solution is to vote. Uh, uh, two, but then I didn't reply. That, that next one, that's not from me. That's, that's just from a, a, another person who says, um, this seems like a weird take, man. And then, uh, and then the original poster does not reply. But the follow-up is from a third person, right, who says, yeah, because we did vote and nothing happened. And I realized there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding going on because that, that third person is right. We sounded the alarms and we shouted from the rooftops and said, you need to do everything in your power in 2020 to go vote to stop a criminally insane game show host from continuing to wreck democracy. And, um, and not nothing happened, by the way, but that's probably not something I can get into in this poll 501c3 thing. Thing. But but it's true that nothing happened to prevent the Supreme Court's opinion in Dobbs because those wheels were set in motion in 2017. Voting in 2020 was too late. Mitch McConnell had already stolen one Supreme Court seat and the president would get to fill two more with judges who explicitly promised to do what the Supreme Court just did. 
To make that not happen, you would have had to have voted in 2016. And thank you, a lot of you did. But not quite enough. Some of you did a truly bad thing. And let me be clear, I mean bad here as strategically bad given your likely preferences. So let's lay those out. On a political spectrum in 2016, the two candidates who actually won any electoral votes were Hillary Clinton and the candidate to her right, Donald Trump. There was also a con artist and professional grifter running a vanity campaign who ran to the left of Hillary Clinton, and her name was Jill Stein. So there you have it from left to right, Stein, Clinton, Trump. And then this thing happens that always happens when you have first past the post voting and winner take all elections votes for the third party. In this case, actually a fourth party. And I'm not going to list all the other random stupid vanity candidates. Who cares? Votes for the third party candidate wind up hurting the candidate most ideologically aligned with that person and helping the candidate most ideologically opposed. So math in Michigan, Trump defeated Clinton by less than 11,000 votes and more than 50,000 people voted for Jill Stein. In Wisconsin, Trump won by 22,000 votes and more than 30,000 people voted for Jill Stein. And in Pennsylvania, the crucial heart of swing states, Trump won by 44,000 and 49,000 voted for Jill Stein. Again, this is just math. I'm not telling you what you should have done in 2016. I'm not saying that Jill Stein cost Hillary Clinton the election. What I'm saying is that if you were a Jill Stein voter, presumably the last thing you wanted was President Trump. And yet that's what happened. Had those Jill Stein voters cast their ballots for Hillary Clinton instead, it is mathematically the case that that would have swung 46 electoral votes. Trump would have never been president. And three of the five justices that wrote the Dobbs opinion I just broke down for you would not have been on the Supreme Court. That was your chance to stop it. And it didn't happen. Now, let me be clear what I'm saying here. I am trying to craft a future strategy based on past history. I'm not saying it's Stein's fault. I, for some reason, this seems to be the first defense that Stein voters give after I give a talk like this. I'm not saying Hillary's campaign didn't suck or that. I, look, none of that matters. The question is, did you want Friday's outcome or not? And if you did not want that outcome, the correct strategy would have been to vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Now, I cannot explain the Pennsylvania Jill Stein voters, but I actually have some insight into those other two states. This comes from talking to a lot of Jill Stein voters, actually. They were looking at this state's electoral history, seven wins in a row for Democrats in Wisconsin, 28 years of unbroken success. Wisconsin voted for Michael Dukakis in 1988, and he was a big suck loser, right? Democrats can't lose Wisconsin. Same thing, Michigan, six years in a row. Okay, they didn't vote for Dukakis, but they voted for everybody else for 24 years. They voted for John Kerry. They voted for Al Gore. Democrats can't lose Michigan. And so the thought process was, hey, Hillary Clinton's going to win my state. Nate Silver says it's a blue lock, right? So it's not a swing state. I'm going to use my vote as a protest to send a message. that You should nominate a more liberal candidate next time. Uh, that didn't go great. Um, historically, people are not good at predicting whether your state's a swing state or not. I mean, Utah, probably not. Right? But uh, past was not prologue for these states in 2016. A state is totally safe until it isn't. But second, never in the history of modern elections have political parties gone back, looked at their margins of victory and defeat with respect to third party candidates and swung left because of it. In fact, the opposite happens. Again, I know you don't want to hear this, but this is reality. When you think about 2000, you probably think about Florida. And I can't blame you, right? When I think about it, I think about New Hampshire. Al Gore, who ran probably the most progressive political campaign in modern American history, narrowly lost New Hampshire by about 7,000 votes. 22,198 people voted for Ralph Nader as the protest vanity liberal third party candidate. So yeah, if a third of Ralph Nader voters in New Hampshire had voted for Gore instead, the shenanigans and the recounts and Bush v. Gore and hanging chants would not have mattered at all. Bush would have had 268 electoral votes with Florida 
and Al Gore 270. Um, if you've forgotten, Bush is the guy who nominated Samuel Alito to the court who wrote the opinion in Dobbs that came down on, on Friday. Now think about each of these elections in 2000 and 2016. Did withholding votes from the Democratic candidate send a message? No. In both subsequent elections, the Democratic Party swung to the right. It said, holy crap, we can't lose this race again. And with the active machinations of the DNC, they put their thumb on the scale for the most conservative Democratic candidate in the field. In 2004, that was John Kerry instead of Howard Dean. Uh, I, I was a Howard Dean volunteer. In 2020, that was Joe Biden instead of Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. Uh, I was an Elizabeth Warren volunteer. So I, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about here. And that gets to the bottom line. Your vote is not a message. Your vote is the right to choose frequently between the lesser of two evils that are narrowly circumscribed. And if you don't like that, start working at the grassroots level to get rid of first past the post voting for instant runoffs. But until those rules change, don't pretend they have. So I want to leave you. <laughs> it's been hard with an, another one last stern warning. I know a lot of us are watching the January 6th hearings and we've pointed and we've laughed at grifters and frauds and liars and incompetent dolts like Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani, who kept claiming even after Joe Biden was inaugurated, that they were going to throw out the whole election and revote and get Trump back into office. And, and surely none of us could be that dumb, right? Well, yeah, that's a Daily Coast article, uh, left wing news site from February 2017. Three weeks after Trump had been inaugurated, breathlessly reporting on the front page about a potentially landmark writ of mandamus that would nullify the 2016 election, it sits on the SCOTUS docket. Uh, it was the work of these grifters and liars who have finally taken down the website after my making fun of them for five years. Uh, Revote 2017. And for the low, low sum of $25, they would have sent you a printed copy of their completely bonkers petition to revote the election, um, which I do not have to tell you did not nullify the 2016 election. Uh, it was indeed assigned docket number 16-1464 at the Supreme Court because anything a crazy person files in crayon at the Supreme Court gets automatically assigned a docket number until it gets dismissed, which of course this thing did. So yeah. Our side is plenty guilty of wishful thinking and motivated reasoning. So here are my takeaways. Number one, the Supreme Court has abandoned its most important historical justification to protect discrete and insular minorities from majority legislation. Number two, the Supreme Court explicitly hates you in particular. They replace the centuries old test with a new one they just made up that says we care only about the historical views of white, male, cisgendered, heterosexual landed property owners. Number three, the last time they did it, they kept at it for 40 years until progressives came back and mustered overwhelming electoral force. We're in year five. This is going to be a long fight. The right spent 50 years to get to this point. We're not going to undo it by the midterms. That's not how you judge being able to fight back. And number four, and most importantly, that fight will be longer if you give up, if you drop out, or if you vote third party. Thank you. I am uh, now happy to, to take questions. Um, okay, so our first question comes from YouTube, and Test it us. seems to be Test Trump us. did a lot of things with using executive orders. It, would some of these Supreme Court decisions be able to be reversed with Biden issuing executive orders? So uh, that's, a fa that's a fantastic question. Uh, I, I could give another talk about how this Supreme Court 
is trying to narrow down the ability of presidents to issue executive orders, uh, because that is a very real thing. And opening arguments listeners know that I am a huge fan of a conservative Supreme Court opinion uh, that uh, has given rise to a doctrine that we call Chevron deference. And this Supreme Court's about to end that as well. Um, so so, uh, so the war continues. Um, the way to think about it is is like this. There are differing levels of authority and then differing potential responses, right? So when the Supreme Court says the Constitution requires something, right, requires you to let kids work 90 hours a week in the acid mines, then that means there's nothing anybody can do about that. Because if the Constitution requires it, you can't pass a law to the contrary at the state or the federal level. There's nothing you can do. And there's no higher institution to interpret the Constitution than the Supreme Court. Only thing you can do is change the composition of the Supreme Court. Now, sometimes the Supreme Court interprets what a law means. When the Supreme Court interprets what a law means, there is a thing you can do about it, and that is amend that law. Now, that's easier said than done because one of the things that one of our two major political parties has done is tried to make it impossible for us to pass or amend laws. And then the third kind of area, and this is where the executive orders come in, modern legislation is the result of, in, in virtually every case, delegated authority from Congress to executive agencies of which the president is the head. Let me give you the example I always use here, which is gun control. Right. When in 1996, the Congress passed gun control legislation banning a whole bunch of semi-automatic weapons, they said, hey, we're going to ban the AR-15. But you didn't want to just say, like, we ban the AR-15 in the text of that law, because then manufacturers would just make the AR-15 plus special edition. Right. And, you know, paint it pink and, you know, whatever. Right. Get around it. And so you would say, we're going to ban weapons that have this cr uh, criteria, and every year we're going to allow the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms to supplement this list with other weapons that they have determined in their judgment are consistent with this legislation. And that's how executive agencies get power. They're delegated to it by Congress. The system that has worked for just about 100 years is the Chevron deference system in which if it is ambiguous as to whether the agency has the authority to issue its proclamations, then you defer to what the agency has decided. Uh, and this Supreme Court is about to replace that with, uh, no, if it's ambiguous, you defer to the courts. Why? Because the courts are run by right wing monsters. So um, the, to pull all that back together, I, I want to be careful because 501c3 stuff. Um, President Biden has done an amazing amount of work via executive order. Feel free to hit me up separately with respect to that, about as much as you could possibly do in ways that would surprise you, in ways that fight for LGBTQ equality throughout the government. Um, but there's just only so much you can do via executive order. Hi, thanks for your presentation. This might be slightly off topic, but do you think that Democrats have a chance to make any kind of significant inroads in the Texas legislature for the next election. Yeah, the, so the question was, as a practical matter, do Democrats have the ability to make inroads in the Texas leg state legislature? Uh, I, I believe that very strongly. I am a noted optimist. Um, the reason I gave this talk, I, I, I said this in the middle, that I put it together, worked all day yesterday, and was here on about 40 hours worth of notice, um, it is because I see a trim, I see two contradictory things going on at the same time. Number one, I see that those of us who identify as progressive are now a clear majority in uh, not just the nation, but in a number of states that have yet to manifest as blue or purple at the national level. Uh, and I see tremendous amounts of, of disaffectedness of folks who have looked at what's happened and I get it and said, all right, well, this, you know, this, this whole political thing is not for me. It doesn't work. Um, 
nothing in my speech was meant to suggest that the problem facing us is not a problem engineered and put into place by one particular political party. We know who that is. Okay. I blame the, the racists and monsters that put that system into place. But the problem is those people did not show up here at Houston Oasis today. They're not watching on YouTube. I, I, they don't listen to my show. I can't reach them. I can reach people who are like-minded, who share our values. A, a, and all I can tell you is that the math supports what I'm saying. If you are disaffected, if you think it won't happen, then you will stay home and it won't happen. Um, we are racing headlong into that in the 2022 midterm elections. I, I only have a voice and a platform to, 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 to people like you. And so all I can say is, you know, that, that same level of urgency that you felt in 2020, that you felt in January of 2021 in the Georgia runoffs, um, it, it sucks that we have to maintain that at that level for the indefinite future. But, but I put up what our history is, right? Um, so I, 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 again, I hit a little bit more pessimism there, but yeah, I, it, look, the, the, the math, the demographics strongly supports uh, Texas being a purple state uh, and, and massive gains in the legislature and, um, and, and working at the grassroots is always the best place to get started. Question I have is, what is the process by which a decision needs to be made by the Supreme Court? What's the series of events until we get to that point? So the question was, what's the process for decisions getting to the Supreme Court? I love this question because I, I think it is implying something that I have talked about on the show that is a, a way of bypassing putting legal questions before this right wing hackery of a Supreme Court. So other than a few edge cases for some of the lawyers out there where the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction in suits between the states and you know, stuff that you don't care about, the Supreme Court has what we call certiorari jurisdiction, right? That is, it takes the cases that it wants. The way in which those cases get granted cert is by what we call the rule of four. That is, if four of the nine justices say, we should take a look at this case, the Supreme Court will add it to its docket, will grant the writ of certiorari, and that term's left over from, I don't know, 13th century Saxon. Right? The Supreme Court can only grant cert in two kinds of cases. And again, asterisk, I know but lawyers love uh, fact-checking me on this, but, but, but by and large, there are two ways to get to the Supreme Court. Number one is an appeal from a federal court of appeal, one of our 13 federal circuits uh, that, that hear cases, that hear appeals as of right from federal district courts. And that is, uh, and those are cases that are properly in federal courts. So they're either about federal laws or federal constitutional decisions. Or number two, appeals from a state Supreme Court decision that affects substantive interpretation of federal constitutional rights. So in other words, if the state of Utah, for example, rules that it is perfectly fine to require everyone to be, uh, you know, all voters to be a member of the Mormon church, um, you could appeal that to the Supreme Court and say, yeah, Utah's state Supreme Court has issued a ruling that is contrary to the First Amendment and then get relief in that particular way. So notice what's not on that list. So stuff that, that, that states could do in a negative way, uh, you always have the right to appeal to the Supreme Court. But when a state says a ruling is a right under the state constitution, if they say, if they go no further than that, then that decision is 100% immune from review by this or any other Supreme Court ever. And I want to give you a real life example. We talked about this three years ago in opening arguments. This is an issue at the ballot box uh, in Kansas uh, in 2022. And that is the Kansas Supreme Court said, we find that the right to an abortion is contained within the liberty clauses of our state constitution. And so if the federal constitution is ever interpreted differently and 
gosh, who could see that coming? It, that does not matter. Abortion will be protected uh, for pregnant persons as a, as a as an aspect of bodily autonomy in the state of Kansas. Now, at the state level, what you can do is amend the Constitution, and that's what they're trying to do in Kansas. Uh, but but this leaves a very very important blueprint. Okay, and that is to say, state courts are free to say our state constitution says. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. We have always read it consistent with what the Supreme Court has said, that that legal phrase is called in pari materia, but we don't have to. We can say in our state, that means we're protecting the basic rights that are inherent in the concept of ordered liberty. And I've been urging state Supreme Courts to, to do that for as long as I've been a lawyer. So uh, it, it's another way in which there, there is an avenue to avoid bringing legal questions before the Supreme Court, because you know what the answer is going to be if you if you bring something up to the Supreme Court. I, I told you these, these decisions were 6-3, and you didn't have to ask what that alignment was. You know who the six are, you know who the three is. All right, we have one question. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for uh, bringing up 30 30- third party voting and grifting, uh, because my question today is about grifting. One of the current narratives coming from grifters is during Obama administration, the Democrats had a filibuster proof majority, but didn't codify Roe into law. Can you explain uh, the law around codifying Roe Also, how can we control the narrative and strategize against that type of talking point? Wow, great question. So that was uh, the Obama, and I have heard this and talked about this on my show. Uh, The Obama administration had a 60 vote supermajority, right? Didn't have to worry about the filibuster uh, in 2009. So why didn't they just codify Roe? Uh, as a matter of federal law in 2009, uh, isn't it really still the Democrats' fault? And then what can we do about this piece of abject nonsense? So first, here's why it's nonsense. Um, You go back and look at that uh, filibuster-proof majority, and it did not include 60 pro-choice Democratic senators. That included Bob Casey, who was outspokenly pro-life at the time. Um, He has since uh, uh, come around to, to modify that position, to sign on to, uh, a law that would, um, protect Roe, uh, and, and, and put an asterisk by that. Uh, but, um, but, but he was asked at the time. So mathematically, no, anybody who's saying that is just wrong as a matter of history, um, is, is also wrong in terms of you, that, that, that that's not the way in which you, go about using your presidential authority, right, by saying, well, I'm concerned that 13 years from now, uh, a criminally insane game show host is going to steal a Supreme Court seat and wreck this. Like, that's just nonsense. It's crazy. And um, I sometimes get why those on our side are looking to blame those on our side because they're the people you can do something about. But 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 this is it's just not it's not, not true as a as a matter of fact um as to what we can do to prevent arguments like this from happening in one on one what i what i try and do is sit down with people and show them the facts right like they 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 will say that and i will say okay think about where you heard that from i'm going to sit you down and show you something in about 30 seconds and if i can do this in 30 seconds i want you to think about why the source that you've been parroting for, for the past couple of months didn't tell you that and whether they're a reliable source or not. I, I can't tell you I have a hundred percent success rate doing that, but um, <laughs> it's all I can do. And again, I, I, I want to illustrate this, right? I, 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 I want to emphasize these people are our friends. They're on our side. They agree with us on 99 issues out of a hundred and it's about maintaining that coalition. And, and all I can do is point out the other side, right? Evangelical Christians showed up 
to vote for a thrice divorced foul mouth philanderer who's never set foot in a church and holds a Bible like it's a, you know, vampire holding a piece of garlic, right? Like that. And they did that on the basis of one promise that he would appoint Supreme Court justices who would overturn Roe v. Wade. And they did that for 50 years. If the other side can stay that kind of lockstep, maybe we could come together with people who aren't, you know, and, and still support those who don't quite get as much of the progressive agenda as we would all like to be done. Um, I, I wish I had more on that, but, uh, you know, I would say try and treat people with charity, try and show them the facts. Thanks. All right. Our next question is from Twitter. Uh, if the Women's Health Protection Act were to pass, would that even stand under the Dobbs decision? It, uh, glad, glad we got the second question because I got carried away in the political aspect there and I forgot to answer the legal aspect. Um, remember the three levels of authority that I, that I talked about. Um, the, the first is uh, interpreting the Constitution. The second is interpreting law. And the third is interpreting administrative agency decisions, delegations of congressional authority. The most Congress can do is pass a law. Now, the way in which the Women's Health Protection Act would work uh, is to say uh, we as Congress have the authority to regulate abortion. We have that under uh, because it's a matter of interstate commerce, right? People who are pregnant travel across state borders in order to obtain abortions. That's a proven fact. And we would like to preempt all state laws and occupy the field. Right. That is, get rid of everything to the contrary at the state level or below and replace that with whatever you, you set to be the standard, right? That uh, there should be no uh, prohibitions on abortion pre-viability of the fetus, for example, which is how I believe the current, um, uh, the current act is written. That could still be challenged in the Supreme Court in one of two ways. Number one. Uh, they could argue that it is not within Congress's power to pass such a law. And if you're thinking, well, they have the whole interstate thing, how could that possibly work? I would refer you to NFIB versus Sibelius, in which this Supreme Court in, a, in, in 2015, right, so a, a more liberal version of this Supreme Court, in an opinion authored by John Roberts, said that Obamacare Right. That the uh, that the that the Affordable Care Act was not authorized as a form of interstate commerce. Now, I can't think of anything that's more interstate commerce than medical care. Right. Like people travel, you get drugs from across the borders. People go into and out of states and, and seek doctors all the time. Um, and uh, and this court said, nope, that's not interstate commerce enough. So uh, could this activist Supreme Court overturn that by saying, yeah, no, this uh, this is just an unconstitutional law. Congress doesn't have the power uh, to supersede uh, the state's will on this issue because uh, this is not really about commerce. This is really about, you know, protecting the unborn, as the uh, Dobbs decision says. Uh, they certainly could. And, you know, I, I don't think you have to 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 be uh, where I am now to think where that where this court would likely come out on that. So, yeah, great question. All right. And I'm trying to keep an eye on the time. So I'm going to ask the last two questions from Zoom. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. You should know better than to try and get me to do a lightning round. <laughs> but we will have you back again at, uh, very soon because uh, everyone loves you. So we need to have you back again. But let me. Uh, the last two questions. Um, first is from Eric on Zoom. Uh, do you think rank order voting will be required in order to offset the transgressions that led to the current makeup of the Supreme Court? I, I love the question. So uh, let me telescope that out a little bit. It's not really that hard to, to fix the current SCOTUS it, it, in conceptual terms, right? All, all we need to do is double the current size of the federal judiciary while a Democrat is in office and then gets to appoint all of those members of the judiciary. Right. Um, by the way, this this is not just a power grab kind of thing. Our judiciary is idiotically overworked. Every judge I know, uh, left, right and center would tell you that that their dockets are about 100 percent too crowded. Um, so uh, 
perfectly defensible and uh, and you would get nine Supreme Court nominees. And all you need is a 50 vote majority to do that. You'd have to break the filibuster in order to pass voting rights reform and Supreme Court reform. And then you'd have to pass that bill. Uh, we don't have that because we have Joe Manchin and, and Kristen Sinema. Uh, but we're not that far from that. Just, that's two. Right. We're not that far from uh, from from being able to uh, to make that broad and sweeping a chain. And that's all it takes. One act of Congress, the Judiciary Act of 2023. Now, is rank order voting, rank choice voting at the local level, is that a good idea? It's a fantastically good idea, right? And we have the technology right now, and we're not the party that thinks that, you know, Dominion voting machines send your ballots to the ghost of Hugo Chavez to adult. No, no, no. Like, yeah, I would love that. I would welcome that. People think that I am anti third or fourth party. Nothing could be further from the truth, right? For somebody whose political views are to the left of the mainstream Democratic uh, uh, party. I, I, I just, we don't have that right now. And the way in which you get that is by agitating and organizing for that change at the local level. Uh, but yeah, at that point, if, if, if on election day you tabulate it up and it is, you know, 48 for the Democrat and 47 for the Republican and five for the Green Party candidate. Uh, and then, OK, well, no one's over 50 percent. Let's add the Green Party candidate to the Democratic candidate. There you go. Congratulations. You win. Then vote. Send as many message votes as you want. Right. That's how you can transform your vote uh, by by changing the way the, the rules are kept. But right now, that's not the law in virtually every jurisdiction. And that has to be built from the ground up. I tried to go faster that time. <laughs> uh, and then a good follow up to that is a question from Roger on Zoom. Uh, what would it take to abolish the two party system? Yeah. and and. That's so <laughs> I abolish is thinking about it from the top down, right? Is there a law you could pass that would do X? And the answer to that is no. And the way to think about that is uh, uh, the entirety of our nation's history. We've had a couple of inflection points, you know, where the Whigs die out or where, you know, Republicans go from being sort of the progressive but pro-business party to the party of racists and monsters. Um, but 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 by and large, right? Every institution we have uh, since 1800 uh, has uh, assumed uh, that, that there are going to be two and only two parties. Y you dismantle that piecemeal from the bottom up, right, by things like RCV, uh, by, by making it possible. And, and, and this is an area where, you know, our, our friends uh, on the, 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 the fourth party left are, are correct, and that is at that point, the institutions will fight back and both Democrats and Republicans will be aligned in not wanting to threaten that that system. They're, they're right about that, but you can make that not matter by appealing to their self-interest. Right. So how do we appeal to self-interest? Right. Ninety nine percent of congressional seats are gerrymandered right now into safe districts, be they safe Democrat districts or safe Republican districts. Um, the people who favor that are incumbents. The people who oppose that are everybody else. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it that needs to inform you in terms of how you're working at, at the state level. Uh, but that's not that's not that's an overcomable problem. Um, so uh, it, it it it's a it's a big issue. I would certainly love to see. I think, you know, parliamentary democracies uh, have uh, much more to commend them. Uh, than certainly our broken system over the past 20 years. Uh, and, you know, we're going to need to think as outside the box as we can to try and fix uh, what, what's going on. Um, but, uh, but, but, but I would say the two things I keep saying, number one, got to be built from the ground up. And number two, until those rules are changed, you, you got to play by the rules we got. So there we go. All right. Thank you so much. And I, I cannot express how grateful we are to uh, for you uh, speaking here to us, um, speaking here to us for um, especially on like like you said of about a forty hour notice. So we re uh, really appreciate it. We're very grateful. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure. I'm happy to be here. You you have always treated me well, even when I have beat up your members. So uh, I I greatly appreciate. It. I can't wait to be out there in person. 
Um, I do want to highlight a couple of upcoming events that we have. Uh, we do have a card players uh, event that meets on Wednesdays. Uh, this week it's at CB and Kevin's house. Um, so if you want information, you can talk to them or Richard Andrews. The information is in our in the bulletin. Um, and we also have the uh, July, August book club coming up. Um, the date is to be determined, but the book is going to be River of the Gods by Candace Millard. We'd like to get started with a couple songs today with, from Joe Crump, uh, who plays around, uh, around town and sometimes a solo artist and sometimes with his band, The Drift. And let's get started with two songs from Joe Crump. Stop to wonder why we're living a life of pain. We're living a life of pain, and love is all around. Gotta find it, cause it's hiding in the basements of the world. Maybe let's get lost in a big art museum. We can lose our bearings, no discerning. Have a lot to discover if we open up our hearts and minds tonight. Imagination taking flight. I never know what to say. I never know what to say when people disagree. I think I'm wrong. I'm holding on to what I want them to be, but they shouldn't close their eyes. But they shouldn't close their eyes to all the majesty everywhere you see. In the world, they get unfurled from us to feed our weary soul. Maybe let's get lost in a big art museum. We can lose our bearings, no despairing. Think that we have a lot to discover if we open up our hearts and minds tonight. Imagination taking place. The beautiful art can fill all the holes in your withering soul. If you keep it away, then your soul will decay, and it's never too late to enjoy the buffet that's been laid out for you. And if you only knew what ubiquitous beauty and passion could do, you make more of an effort to take in the view, because you lose this meaning if you don't pursue all the love. Love, 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 love. In a big art museum, we can lose our bearings, no discerning. I think that we have a lot to discover if we open up our hearts and minds tonight. Imagination taking flight. 